Hello, welcome. Welcome to Vernal Pools of the Santa Rosa Plain with Ag and Open Space and the Laguna Foundation. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. As you join us, we would love to know who is out there in the audience. Feel free to say hello in the chat box and let us know where you're tuning in from today. And perhaps also share if you've seen a vernal pool before or what brings you here today to this presentation about vernal pools. We'd love to know if there are vernal pool, vernal pool fans already out there or if you're coming to learn and become a vernal pool fan. Also want to let you know this presentation is being recorded and will be sent in a follow-up email. Thank you for joining Vernal Pools of the Santa Rosa Plain. We will get started here in just a minute. We'll wait for more folks to join us. We have a lot of great information all about Vernal Pools to share with you this afternoon. I will get started right at four. But in the meantime, I'd love to hear who's out there. If you'd like to share your name, where you're tuning in from and your relationship to Vernal Pools, um, we would love to hear about it. So if someone says, I saw them every year I lived in Santa Rosa. Yes, see the ver beautiful Vernal Pools near Sebastopol and I want to learn more about them. Welcome, got some folks from Marin who have visited the Vernal Pool area in Santa Rosa previously. Yes, sounds like we've got a lot of folks who are already fans of Vernal Pools, which is great to hear. All right, it is four o'clock. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for tuning in to Vernal Pools of the Santa Rosa Plain. If you haven't already, feel free to say hello in the chat box and let us know where you're tuning in from today and maybe share a little field note about vernal pools, a little bit about your relationship to them. Have you seen them before? Are you coming to learn more? Um, we'd love to know who's out there in the audience. Also wanted to let you know that this presentation is being recorded and will be sent to you in a follow-up email sometime tomorrow, once I can get it uploaded. And we will just start off I will start off by saying my name is Allison Titus and I am the Community Education Manager here at the Laguna Foundation. For this particular talk, I also believe that I should mention that I am a fervent Vernal Pool fan and a native plant enthusiast. And I got started in conservation work doing plant surveys on Mount Tamalpais in Marin. And I, am, I also am on the board for the California Native Plant Society Milo Baker chapter here in Sonoma County and a member of CNPS as well, as are the rest of our panelists here today. I'd like to begin this place-based presentation with a land acknowledgement. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects indigenous people as traditional stewards of this land and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous people and their traditional territories. The Laguna sits within the homeland of the Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo people. To raise awareness for the ancestral and current indigenous people's presence in the Laguna watershed, we pay our respect to the past, present, and future generations of Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo people and their WAPO neighbors. This feels important to share before talking about our work caring for the Laguna watershed. If you'd like to know more about the indigenous land that you live on, you can visit this resource that I'll drop here in the chat called native-land.ca to get started um, with learning more about the land you live on. So a little bit more about the Laguna Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization that works to restore, conserve, and inspire public appreciation for the Laguna de Santa Rosa wetlands. The Laguna is a wetland and a 22 mile long waterway, as well as an entire watershed that encompasses Santa Rosa, Cotati, Rohnert Park, and parts of Sebastopol and Windsor. The Laguna de Santa Rosa wetlands have been heavily impacted by development and they now face important issues that drive our restoration, conservation, and education work today. However, that's not the whole story. 
Despite those challenges, the Laguna is a biodiversity hotspot, home to endangered plants and animals that we will learn lots about today and has the very special designation of being a wetland of international importance. We restore these special wetlands by completing conservation science projects, planting native trees, shrubs, and forbs, managing invasive species, and increasing public knowledge and appreciation through our school programs and community programs like this webinar today. We do this important work of conserving and restoring this watershed with the support and partnership of organizations like Ag and Open Space. We host outings on, learn about, and explore the open space that Ag and Open Space has preserved and protected in Sonoma County with conservation easements. They have preserved over 122,000 acres in Sonoma County to date with this conservation tool. This open space helps us be more resilient. Yes, <laughs> big round of applause. We're so grateful. This open space helps us be more resilient to extreme weather events and climate change and the many grasslands, forests, and wetland ecosystems within that 122,000 acres store and sequester vast amounts of carbon. This presentation and many more of our outings on the land are made possible with your public support of ag and open space and conservation in Sonoma County. Today, we will be learning about both the Laguna Foundation and Ag and Open Space's work in protecting vernal pool ecosystems on the Santa Rosa Plain, in addition to learning about the unique ecology and biology of these habitats. And I am joined here today by three wonderful speakers. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce them and then get right into introducing what vernal pools are. And I just wanna point out that I am asking each of these experts to do an incredibly challenging task, which is to talk about something they all have years of expertise in for just 10 to 15 minutes to give you an introduction to the diversity of these ecosystems. So Candice, Michelle, and Trish, thank you so much for sharing this introductory, introductory information to one of the most rare ecosystems in our county. I'll introduce each person, then I'll give kind of a little bit intro to what a vernal pool is. So Michelle Halver studied the conservation genetics and ecology of Sebastopol meadow foam in the Santa Rosa Plain for her master's thesis at Purdue. And since 2011, Michelle has served as Pepperwood Preserves Ecologist, where she oversees Pepperwood's community science and visiting scholars programming and advises their land stewardship activities and projects. She is on the boards of the California Native Plant Society Milo, ba Milo Baker chapter and the California Native Grassland Association. Welcome, Michelle, and thank you to you and to Pepperwood for your support on this webinar today. Next is Candace Gilmore. She is an instructional support technician in the biology department at Sonoma State, and she has worked as a field researcher in the Rocky Intertidal, Oak Woodlands, and Vernal Pool grassland ecosystems. Her master's thesis research focused on pollinators of three of Sonoma County's endemic and endangered vernal pool plant species. She is on the board of directors of Conservation Works and is the current president of the Pacific Coast Entomological Society. Ah, that's a hard, that word always trips me up. <laughs> Last but not least is Trish Tatarian. She is a general ecologist experienced with a wide range of taxa and has worked in the biological consulting field since 1992. And she has a long time focus on amphibian telemetry research. She possesses state and federal permits for surveys and research with the California red-legged frogs, California tiger salamander, western pond turtle, and other species. She is also on the California Native Plant Society Milo Baker chapter board as the conservation co-chair. So all native plant enthusiasts, lots to go over and a lot of expertise in these three topics. So thank you all again for being here to share. So before we dive into vernal pools, let's meet the Santa Rosa Plain, the area in the Laguna watershed where vernal pools are found. The Santa Rosa Plain is the flat floodplain area between the coastal range here in Sevastopol and the main Laguna channel and the Myakamas Mountains to the east. 
On the Santa Rosa plain, with its clay hard pan and seasonal flooding, vernal pools are all around us. You may see them when driving from Santa Rosa over to Sebastopol, across this flat section here, or vice versa, on Highway 12, perhaps, or Occidental Road, or off of Piner. However, even though vernal pools are all around us, most people are not aware that this is what they are looking at out their car window. What is a vernal pool? Let's start with the basics, the gestalt of vernal pools. This is the most common type of vernal pool viewed while you are zooming down the car on your road on Highway 12 or on Occidental. You can see a slight change in vegetation. Note the bright acid green grass on the sides of the pool here, and then the taller dark green and brown California semaphore grass in the middle occupying the vernal pool, denoting a change in the landscape here, however subtle it may be. Pictured here, this is a natural vernal pool in a private dairy off of Yano Road. There is Sonoma sunshine and Sebastopol meadow foam and many other species nestled within the grass, but you can't see them from afar. So this is more what you would see at a distance. This is also a typical vernal pool with water perched on the surface. The white flower you see here in the foreground is common meadow foam. We have both the rare Sebastopol meadow foam and the common meadow foam. This pool is just west of Youth Community Park in Santa Rosa. Vernal pools are essentially small seasonal wetlands. Wetlands are areas where water covers the soil or is present either at or near the surface of the soil all year for varying periods of time during the year. Water saturation or hydrology largely determines how the soil develops and the types of plant and animal communities living in and on the soil. Wetlands may support both aquatic and terrestrial species, but the prolonged presence of water creates conditions that favor the growth of specially adapted plants and promote the development of characteristic wetland soils. Vernal pools are specifically seasonal wetlands since they are wet during some of the year and then completely dry up during the rest of the year. Vernal pools typically occur in areas with Mediterranean climates. This special limited climate, as you can see, is often referenced in botanical and ecological presentations like these. It is characterized by mild winters with a defined rainy season and hot, dry summers. The Mediterranean climate pattern means that vernal pools vary in how they look throughout the year. Each season has a distinct look within the pools during the fall and winter rains, water collects in the shallow depressions where the downward percolation of water is prevented by the presence of a hard pan or a clay pan layer below the soil surface here. Later in the spring, when rains decrease and the weather warms, the water evaporates and we get these blooms, the part of the vernal pools we all love, for just a really brief period of time. And then the pools generally disappear by May and the shallow depressions remain relatively dry until late fall, something like this, and once the precipitation returns. The depth of the soil is really important for vernal pool plants. This is a pretty good diagram here. Invading plants prefer deeper soils. So vernal pool plants have a competitive edge when that soil horizon is about six inches. In this diagram, there's actually a soil layer missing. There should be one just right on top of the hard pan rather than just hard pan straight to the perched water table. Um, there should be a layer of soil. But what's really important is that the depth of soil above the hard pan is only about half a foot. We think that the shallow soil layer makes that habitat better suited for vernal pool species and less suited for species that need deep roots. 
this begs the question, could you make a vernal pool in your backyard with a hose? <laughs> Maybe if you live on the Santa Rosa Plain, you need a perched water table like this on top of this hard pan or clay pan layer or else the water would just go into the soil all around. It's like if you made a depression into a sponge and it's a pretty dynamic hydrologic situation. Note here that this transitional zone on the edge of the vernal pools will never be fully underwater, but will have saturated soils. This zone has a combination of upland and wetland plants, which we will get to shortly. My last note on this is that this is a hard year, perhaps, for becoming a vernal pool fan. It is a very dry year, and many vernal pool species are struggling. The vernal pools never fully filled with water this winter like you see here. And this means the unique vernal pool plants are subject to increased competition from invasive annual grasses and forbs um, that can move in when they aren't, when that perched water is not there. Um, so we're seeing a lot of grasses and things in the vernal pools this year. It's also important to note that vernal pools were once abundant throughout California grasslands, providing habitat for many rare and endemic organisms. They are found in other places across California. We have some folks here from the Jepson Prairie, which is a great place to see vernal pools as well. That being said, today, less than 10% of vernal pool habitat remains across the state. My coworker Asa likes to say that vernal pools also make great habitat for highways. <laughs> they are flat and really hard. And we have lost, the Santa Rosa Plain has lost 85% of its vernal pools within the last 50 years, having undergone a significant transformation, shifting from a largely rural, residential, diverse agricultural and extensive open space with seasonal and perennial wetlands and vernal pool grasslands and oak woodlands to more and more urbanization and intensive agriculture. Through this change in land use, the vernal pool ecosystem habitat on the Santa Rosa Plain has suffered great losses significantly reducing the numbers of populations of local endemic animal and plant species. And many are now federally and state listed as endangered, including many of the species we'll be talking about today, the California tiger salamander and four endemic plant species. So our goal with programs like this, as I said, is to create an educated community of vernal pool lovers that advocate and protect vernal pools in Sonoma County and beyond now that you know how special they are and who lives within them. Okay, so that was a real quick introduction to vernal pools. Remember, they are a seasonal wetland with the impermeable soil layer, and they have specific indicator plants. Um, and I will hand it over to Michelle Halber to talk more about the vernal pool and upland plants that we see associated with these ecosystems here in Sonoma County. Thank you so much, Allison. That was awesome. What a great intro. Um, first of all, I'm just really excited to be here. I'm so glad all of you can join us today and hopefully we come away with some shared enthusiasm for vernal pools if you already don't have any. Um, they are so amazing and really it, that those floral displays just capture our hearts right these are incredible islands of diversity among a whole sea a matrix of grasses um, these plants and animals have evolved for millennia under these really kind of harsh conditions going from that really wet condition to extremely hot and dry in the summer months and so they have really unique adaptations and today I'm going to share some of those with you and kind of take you through a journey of the plants that occur within the Santa Rosa Plain that you might see. So this here is a pool from the Central Valley, from Mather Fields, if you're familiar with that area. Um, the Central Valley pools tend to be a lot more showy and have these really great floral displays compared to the pools we have here in Sonoma County that Allison was talking about. So this is a, a pool within the Santa Rosa Plain, characterized by that California semaphore grass, but the value is still there, right? These pools provide water quality, um, they help provide habitat for a rare and endemic species, and they're very important for our, our heritage here. 
Unfortunately, some of the pools on the Santa Rosa Plain are quite weedy. We have um, a lot of species kind of moving in, as Allison alluded to, either in drought years or in cases where there might not be some historic disturbances to kind of keep weeds at bay. So this here is a pool that's inundated with curly dock, uh, Rumex crispus, but it still supports a rare plant called Sebastopol metaphon that you see in white here. We also have some linear features. So this is a swale um, kind of near Todd and Yano or Llano roads, and it has Sebastopol metaphon as well. So this feature doesn't have the characteristics of a vernal pool, but it still supports vernal pool associated plants and species and may have running water instead of water that you know, evaporates over time. This swale may have run running water, but does support a lot of diversity. So a lot of these plants, because of these harsh conditions, um, are, are annual plants. They live their entire life cycle in one year. During the hot summer months, they are dormant as these, you know, live embryos, live plant embryos in seed coats in the soil layer, waiting for the rains to come, for the pools to fill, and that's when they are cued to germinate. So they germinate underwater, they grow through the water column, reach up towards the sun, and do their photosynthesis up there. But if you've ever gardened or you know, maybe have potted plants at home, if you overwater your plants, what happens, right? They, you're essentially suffocating your plants. You're drowning them. They can't breathe because they don't have adaptations to these wet conditions. Well, some vernal, vernal pool plants have specialized tissue, such as the aranchyma tissue you see here. This is a um, cross section of a stem with aranchyma tissue. And this is what it might look like under a microscope. It's a special tissue that is basically single cell walls that create these large gaps in the stems, increasing surface area and allowing gas exchange under these wet conditions, allowing the plant to survive these wet, wet inundation periods. I love this picture. This pool here is a created pool on the Santa Rosa Plain for mitigation. Um, and why I love this image is because it really shows you how closely linked the hydrology is to the plant communities and the different species that occur here. Various species are going to find their niche space based on how wet it is or how long it's wet. What happens when these pools dry down, you might get, you know, concentric rings of flowering. So we have species that occur on the pool margins or edges. And as this pool dries down, you might get more floral blooms towards the center or a whole new suite of species popping up towards the center where those species might prefer longer wetter periods or maybe drier, shorter periods of water in inundation. So there's a lot of ecologists and geneticists really interested in how what is a shallow pool to us is actually a very steep hydrologic gradient with regards to plant community composition. Now, if you take a, the similar concept, but a different viewpoint here, imagine us doing what we'd love to call vernal pool botanists, our belly botanists. You have to get on your belly. So here in this picture, we're on our belly. We're looking down at these plant communities and uh, looking out towards the edge of a pool. So in the foreground here, we have a whole community of endemic vernal pool species. They tend to be you know, stunted in growth, smaller in stature, um, a lot of wildflowers, not very many grasses because grasses can't you know, thrive within this, this vernal pool soils or water situation here. And then looking towards the center of this image, not very far away from us, we have this kind of crusty soil you see here. That is the pool margin. That's the edge of the pool. And immediately right outside that in what we call the upland habitat, you have a whole different community of plants. You really don't have to go far to find, you know, incredible diversity and changes in communities. You have grasses, you've got um, what looks like a cat's ear here or in the, you know, like a, a sunflower family, as well as some meadow foam. It's amazing. I love it. So I'm going to introduce you to some of the species that you might commonly see in the Santa Rosa Plain. This is a close-up image of the semaphore grass we've been showing you. Grasses are flowers. They're not showy because they're um, pollinated by wind instead of animals, instead of insects. They don't have to have showy petals to attract pollinators. So instead, they just dangle their reproductive parts out in the wind, like these male stamens here and their female pistils here which are these little white crystalline structures, and they make new seeds. 
Jepson's button celery is a plant that has that very characteristic hollow stem, that arenchyma tissue I was talking to you about. Nice, juicy, succulent, you know, tissues. Um, it will grow up in the vernal pool when it's wet and persist through the dry season. It goes in flower a little bit later than most plants. Um, and to prevent herbivory, because it's this, again, this juicy succulent out there, um, it has a lot of thorny kind of features to it to prevent things from eating it. This is Rosie Douglas Meadow Foam. I love this one because the, the nice burgundy venation on the petals. Spotted throat down ingia. It's an interesting genus. A lot of these um, down ingias, when they're developing, they actually, the flowers will twist upside down. Vernal pool monkey flower. Rayless goldfields, which is one of the more common species you'll find in our vernal pools here. And if you're not aware, this is in the sunflower family. And so what you're looking at is not one flower, but hundreds of flowers. Each one of these little circles you see is an individual flower. These are disc flowers. And each one of these that looks like a petal, those are actually individual ray flowers. And the reason it's called rayless goldfields is because these ray flowers are pretty diminished in size. Douglas mezzamint. Oh, I just want to breathe in that purple color. It's so pretty. We've got our vernal pool um, paintbrush here and you can see it. It's like this kind of pale yellow in the center of this gorgeous pool. This person who's studying this pool is so lucky. And then in the hot dry months, we also get, um, sorry, I have to move my little board here. Um, in the hot dry months, we also get plants that are adapted to those, you know, clay soils, dry conditions. And so you get cute little things like these tiny dwarf woolly heads coming up. And all of these hairs here will pr protect it from drying out. Um, they pre prevent desiccation. As well as this pygmy weed, Crassula. So pygmy weed is, um, it's basically a succulent. If you guys know jade plant, that's a crassula. So a lot of the species in this genus are adapted to hot, dry conditions. And then there's also a lot of, a lot of plants out there. Your round, linear-leaved rushes and things that all look fairly similar. And I'm not gonna go into what they are because they're hard to tell apart, but they, there's so many different unique species out there. And this one is flowering. It's very kind of, hidden down here. I don't know if you can see these flowering parts down here, but I love how messy, how messy this species looks. And then there's plants that float on the pool surface, like this water starwort or Lobs aquatic buttercup. Um, if you're not aware, the California Native Plant Society has a rare plant ranking list, and this one is considered limited in distribution, mostly around the San Francisco Bay Area. And this particular um, species is what we call heterophilus, meaning different leaves. The leaves at the surface are broad and lobed, and they're doing what they do best. They're photosynthesizing. They're making sugars and food for this plant. And then the leaves under the water are more filamentous or needle-like, thread-like underwater. Bractless hedge hyssop is fairly common in our pools. And I show this one because it has these kind of broader leaved broader rounded leaves here and a small white flower that is very similar to a rare plant that you'll find in our pool, which is dwarf down ingia. This plant is, um, is rare in California, but common elsewhere. And this here is a map of its range, just to give you a sense of how it's distributed within Sonoma County, as well as in some Central Valley vernal pools here. Now onto our endemic endangered species. We have Sonoma Sunshine here. It's one of the earliest bloomers within our vernal pools, and it's very restricted to Sonoma County. These are maps generated by CalFlora, which is a great online database, and there are some public records there, so I'm not exactly sure what these observations you see outside our county are from, um, but it's, it's restricted to Sonoma County, to the best of my knowledge. Burke's Goldfields is in the sunflower family. So again, this one has the disc flowers and these nice big ray flowers here. And it's really appropriately named. I mean, this plant creates these gorgeous fields of golden. And I want you to look at this um, image to the bottom left, which is of a, a goldfield plant in fruit. So if you think of a dandelion, it's in the same family as this. And it has 
that white stuff right on the edge of the seeds that it's called pappus and that helps it distribute by wind and, and carry far away from the maternal plant. Well, this pappus you see is very tiny and diminished in size and that makes sense. If you're a vernal pool plant, you want vernal pool conditions. You want to have more localized dispersal right where you are. They're small seeds, so perhaps some blow away in the wind or catch on smaller animals. Um, some might float away in wet years between pools, but mostly it stays local. And here we have the distribution. And then Sebastopol meadow foam, which is also another endangered species located within Sonoma County. It's so these plants are found nowhere else in the world, you guys. These are our neighborhood plants. And um, Sebastopol meadow foam, there are a couple populations known outside of Sonoma County, but it's primarily from within Sonoma County, the entire plant range. And there are common meadow foams. So I wanna show you, they're very similar as far as the flowers are concerned. So I wanna show you that there are some distinct characteristics to look for to see if what you're looking at, if you're out there in a pool, is actually Sebastopol meadow foam. And that's the leaves really are characteristic here. So Sebastopol meadow foam has a smooth leaf margin or edge of the leaf, and they look like little spoons compared to the more jagged common meadow foam you see here adjacent to it. This picture here is of Sebastopol meadow foam and Sonoma sunshine together. And th these are the fruits developing from Sebastopol meadow foam or nutlets. And the surface on them, different species of limnanthes have different surface textures relating to how they disperse. And these ones are called tubercled nutlets. And they most, lo they most uh, likely have local dispersion where they basically drop their seeds and they stay local within the same pools. And I was really fortunate to um, go to the California Academy of Sciences and see the plant that Orndorff in 1968 collected um, near Todd and Yana Rhodes and basically described this species for the first time. And so this is what we call a holotype. This is the reference species. If there's any dispute or questions about um, different species or subspecies, this is the plant you go to. The earliest known detection or collection of Sebastopol metaphone was made in 1946, but it wasn't formally described until 1968. And this is a swale within that same region. Who knows, it might be the same area that Orndorff actually collected from in 1968. And I love the name meadow foam because it's literally what it looks like. It's foaming in the meadow. It's just absolutely splendid. So I hope you learned a little something. I'm, uh, I really encourage you guys to get out there if you can, get to know your local vernal pools and help with conservation because you know this is part of our Sonoma County heritage and these critters are relying on us to help protect them and steward them. And with that, I will pass it on to Candace who will be sharing with us about the wonderful pollinators that are associated with these species. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Here we go. I'm finding my window. Hi, everybody. My name is Candace. Um, I'm going to talk to you about vernal pool pollinators. I was very lucky um, to be sort of recruited to work on a project with a scientist that was working at Laguna Foundation at the time um, to start learning about the pollinators of, that are associated with the endangered plants. Uh, Christina Sloop. She was the director of conservation science of Laguna Foundation. Um, in 2009, she reached out to me and asked if I could join um, the team because I had um, experience in entomology, studying insects, because she was studying the conservation genetics of the three endangered plants. And she wanted to know more about in, uh, insects and pollinators, which are also a driver of gene flow. So I, um, got to work on it as a technician, and then it also became my master's degree research project. So I um, want to acknowledge the scientists who came before me who worked a lot on the topic of vernal pool bees. Dr. Robin Thorpe was a professor at UC Davis, and um, he actually described the species of bee that's a specialist on Blenosperma. It's called Andrina blenospermatis. And he worked a lot on um, a lot of different subjects related to bees, native bees and honeybees. And um, he, you know, 
wrote a lot of papers about vernal pool bees and he helped me a lot when I collected uh, bees, I would, you know, bring them to him and he would confirm, oh yeah, they, these are the different species that they are. Uh, Joan Leong was a grad student of Robin Thorpe's who also worked a lot on vernal pool pollinators specifically and on Blenosperma. And so she did projects in the Central Valley mostly, but she also did some side projects in Santa Rosa. So the bees that they um, found to be associated closely with vernal pool plants are in the family Andrenidae. They're also called mining bees. Uh, it's a large family, has a lot of species, and they're called mining bees because they nest in the ground. Many of them are oligolectic, which means that they are really picky about the pollen that they gather, and most are solitary bees. Um, so the key character for the andrenity is that they have what's called two subantennal sutures, which are these little, these two little wrinkles on their forehead. Um, that's one of the key characters. Wing venation can be another one. Um, so it's little details that it's helpful to um, look at them under a microscope to see specifics. But once you start to know the characteristics of bees, you can sort of see them more by eye also. So when I say solitary bee, what does that mean? Most people are familiar with honeybees that live in a hive and they have a queen and workers and honeycomb and everything. Well, with solitary bees, each female makes her own nest. And uh, for mining bees that nest in the ground, an example of a life cycle is that uh, the female will excavate a nest and will go out and gather pollen and nectar and gather it up into a little ball that they call bee bread we call it um but it's nutrition for the the baby bee and put uh, lay an egg on top of that and then form a new nest chamber go out forage more and so the egg hatches out becomes a larva it will eat the pollen and nectar ball that's left for it it'll pupate like go into a cocoon like a butterfly and then it'll um become an adult, but like wait underground until its host plant is blooming until the next year. So a lot of these bees only have one generation per year and then the cycle repeats again. Um, and a lot of these bees that are associated with vernal pools are called oligolectic bees. That's a kind of a very specific term. Oligo uh, means few, lectic means feeding. And so the, they will get nectar from other flowers but when they're going to get pollen for their nests, they like to get them from close, from like specific groups. So mostly plants within the same genus. So, and, and they, uh, because they have one generation per year, they need to come out when their plants are blooming. And so um, they're very sensitive to fr uh, habitat fragmentation or habitat loss. And there's even, um, Anecdotal evidence, we're not exactly sure how they know when to come out at the right time, but there's been years when it's been really a drought year and not a lot of flowers are out and they haven't found it. They Bees can wait a year to, to emerge. So um, that's an interesting thing. So a lot of these really close up photos that we have here were from uh, research done by Robin Thorpe at Jepson Prairie and his technician, Dennis Briggs, took a lot of the photos. They, they were able to find where the nests were and excavate one and take pictures of it. So that's what I'm showing you today. But um, because they're a specialist on Blenosperma, we, they have Blenosperma nanum in the Jepson Prairie. We have Blenosperma bakeri here. So um, there's, uh, for example, this group that works on Blenosperma is called Andrina blenospermatis. And here's a map of the, the line is the range of the plant and all these little dots are where they found the bee, Andrina blenospermatis. This is a map of the bee Andrina pulvria, which is a specialist on meadow foams. You know, there's different species of meadow foam, common meadow foam, whatever there's, um, here's this line represents the extent of it. There's also meadow foams that are self-pollinating that occur up into Oregon. And they found the Limnanthes bee quite, quite all over the place. <laughs> uh, for Andrina submista, it uh, uses Lasthenia or Burke's Goldfield as its host plant. 
And it's been found in many, many spots throughout California. And they also found that uh, Downingia has a very small specialist bee called Panerginus atriceps. And they haven't found it in that many places. Here's the map of the different types of Downingia, short anther, long anther, and sulfur, um, the distribution, and then the different spots on the map where they happen to find the bee. I also found this bee in, in my surveys, and this map is from before that. And Robin, when I showed it to him, he's like, you helped me put more dots on my map. So there's more discoveries to be made out there, even though these are well-studied ecosystems. Other flower visitors that are um, could be pollinators also moving from flower to flower. I have I see a lot of golden dung flies visiting flowers eating pollen. Um, I think they're around a lot because in uh, nearby vernal pools there there are cows and the golden dung flies use <laughs> cow patties for um, for their larvae and they're around flies a lot. Surfid flies they look like bees. Um, but they're flies, they have a striped abdomen, and they use pollen and nectar, um, not for their larvae, their larvae are predaceous and live in the ground, but um, as adults, they fly around from flower to flower. And then these bombolead flies, um, they are have a hairy body and they have a long proboscis and drink nectar. They are really prolific on gold fields. Um, Berks goldfields, and then I've seen them in other wildflower areas on California gold fields too. Um, they can be pollinators and they're also, I don't know about the specific species I found um, in the Santa Rosa Plain, but in general, um, the bombolia flies are nest parasites of ground nesting bees. So they will lay their eggs, they'll sneak into the nest, they'll lay their eggs in ground nesting bees, and then the larva will hatch out and eat the pollen <laughs> and the bee. Um, so they're like, uh, there's an article about them that calls them the pollinator with a bad reputation. <laughs> because there's there are nest parasites um and then there's a, a lot sometimes if you these flowers are very little and if you look on them you'll see a lot of little tiny black beetles that are visiting them um, some of them are in the family dicey today some are in maliri day and then carpet beetles dramestidae um, they're very small they're like like two one or two pinhead sizes <laughs> um a uh, quick summary of my re thesis research is that I looked at the insect visitation rates of the three endangered species, like looking at a quadrat, watching how many were coming to see the rates of visitation. And I was comparing natural and constructed vernal pool sites um, visually and then um, counting. And then also to confirm what species they are, I collected some insects with a net and also with pan traps. And um, so overall, insect visitation rates were generally higher in natural sites than constructed sites. That wasn't the case for Sebastopol meadow foam, however, um, but it, it was pronounced with Sonoma sunshine and with Berks gold fields. And I noticed um, that the closer a constructed pool is to a natural pool, the more insect visitation was observed. Um, and we also found very high numbers of the limnanthe specialists, the, the meadow foam bee. We found a meadow foam bee very abundant in both natural and constructed vernal pools. And it was the most common bee that I collected in my traps and with the net. And I think part of the reason why it's so abundant is because we also have common meadow foam. And so there's lots of food for it. So it has like a big population and a wider range. Um, so thank you. And I want to, um, introduce the next person who in our talk, which is Trish Chatarian. Thank you, Candace. That was awesome. Great photos. Love the work. Um, so I wanted to share with you my talk. So I wanted to share this quick little picture of this guy. He was traveling, if you notice the date, um, in February 17th, on February 17th in 2016. This was actually a camera photo of uh, an animal moving underground between um, the, a known breeding um, habitat and then a known between a known location of upland habitat. So this kind of gives you an idea of the size of the animals. Those are um, coastline oak leaves. And uh, so this is a, probably a young animal moving around uh, 
in the winter rains. Technical difficulties, sorry. Um, so um, the California tiger salamander occurs throughout um, California. There are three major populations with the two populations in Sonoma County and in Santa Barbara being federally listed endangered. And those are shown in the green um, on the, in the map on the left-hand side. This is an old map, but it gives you the, the basis of the population size roughly for the Central Valley and where they occur <clears throat> um, in the Central Valley population. And so the Santa Barbara and the Sonoma County are two distinct genetically, um, two distinct populations um, from the Central Valley population. And on the right-hand side, this is where the Santa Rosa Plain um, is outlined in purple. And this Santa Rosa Plain is really the flatlands as it pertains to um, supporting vernal pools and California tiger salamanders. Allison showed us uh, the Santa Rosa Plain and the watershed moving more towards the east over to 12 um, up into the Mayakama Mountains. But for federally listed um, plants and animals, as well as state listed plants and animals, this Santa Rosa Plain is the map that um, hosts the majority of um, these listed species. The triangles here show where the animals have been documented. It's not a complete location of where everybody is because not all lands have been surveyed for animals, but this shows you at this, at this time roughly where everything has been documented. And so I just want to draw your attention to here. We've already lost a group of breeding individuals down here in Rona Park. And so it's something to pay attention. While we've had a range expansion down here into Two Rock, um, we've lost this group over here. So um, just something to keep a, your eyes out and thinking about as you're driving around looking at different vernal pools, like, yeah, there's probably salamanders out there somewhere. But when you go up to Windsor, that's really where all, that's where the plants are occurring, not salamanders. So while plants, we have a variety of different plants um, and wonderful invertebrates pollinating our vernal pools, our top aquatic predator, and as well as subterranean predator, is the California tiger salamander. And I've got um, two pictures here. They're not both the same animal. But I just wanted to share with you our common um, two salamanders that happen on the Santa Rosa Plain. California tiger salamanders are a mole salamander in the family Ambistomatidae. They're a large terrestrial salamander and the only group to occupy grasslands. They basically spend 97% of their life terrestrially, subterranean terrestrially. Um, they have, um, they come out once or twice in their lifetime to breed. Um, and then they spend the majority of their life underground during the hot summer months. When it's raining and cold in the winter, they will come and move uh, above ground and eat invertebrates. Um, the lower left picture is an arboreal salamander. It's of the lungless salamander uh, family, family Plethodontidae. Um, and I'm showing these two because often people get the species confused. And I've had many people come up to me and say, oh, I've got a tiger salamander. It's like, oh, great, show me. And nope, it's an arboreal. And so what I wanted to share with you, the difference between the arboreal and, and California tiger salamander, besides the coloring, the, the, the tiger salamanders are a nice dark black or dark gray with yellow spots. The arboreal salamander also has yellow spots, but it's more of a brownish rust color. The key characteristic between these two species is the wonderful blunt round head of the California tiger salamander versus the pointy nose of the arboreal salamander and these huge jaw muscles that are located behind the eye. Um, and that leads it to having a more triangular head compared to the round flat head of the California tiger salamander. 
California tiger salamander is a larger animal. It measures three to five inches in length compared to arboreal, which is about two and a half to four inches. Um, the arboreal salamander is completely terrestrial. They lay their eggs um, in uh, downed logs. Um, they're not aquatic at all, whereas the California tiger salamanders do breed in our wonderful vernal pools. So adults move from upland habitat into the water after the first series of rains when the pools start ponding, with a breeding migration typically occurring between November and January. They lay their eggs singly or in clutches, and shown in the upper right here, the series of three eggs right there. Um, they're attached to structures. Because they're laying their eggs at the beginning of the winter season, the first rains are hitting, not a lot of vegetation is growing at that point because pretty much everything has died off. So when I say structures, I mean dead grass, sticks, barbed wire fences, if they're in the vernal pool or the pond, um, just things that are in the vernal pool before the plants begin to grow. Larvae hatch in 10 to 20 days from uh, uh, after egg laying. Um, and when looking at a vernal pool, we're always focusing, us, I mean amphibian specialists, we're always focusing on when, how long the vernal pools contain water. Because they need to contain water f until at least uh, um, May, 12 to 24 weeks for development for our tiger salamanders. Tiger salamanders can be differentiated between tadpoles. And in the lower left picture, I've got a wonderful picture of a California red-legged frog right there, <laughs> um, flower in his hair. Um, but the Cal California tiger salamander, the gills are feathery. They've got four legs, they've got a tail for swimming. Um, and they lack basically, you know, stripes or patterns, but it's really these gills that show up. And they're not always red, they're really, they can be vibrant green as well. The salamander from um, Contra Costa County was towards the end of the, spring season, so it's quite a bit larger. But this gives you an idea of the size difference between, say, tadpoles, frog tadpoles. California red-legged frog is our largest state frog, and so even when we've got our largest state frog next to it, a California tiger salamander is pretty big. When they're in the larva stage like this, they are voracious eaters of invertebrates, aquatic invertebrates, and mosquito larvae. You can feed a lot of mosquito larvae to these guys, so um, they are a voracious aquatic uh, predators. So I've thrown out aqua the term aquatic habitat. And what I mean by this is that water bodies hold water until May and include vernal pools, but they also include drainage ditches. They include water, tr uh, water um, cattle ponds. Um, Although permanent ponds are typically occupied by salamanders, they can be occupied by other predators such as well. Sometimes fish can get into them when our um, creeks uh, overflow into our larger ponds. Um, we can get stickle back in there that can feed on the eggs. Um, if the ponds are super deep in Sonoma County and they're perennial, we can have California bullfrog, which are predators of just about anything they can fit in their mouth. Um, so. We prefer to have the ponds when we're creating ponds for California tiger salamander to um, not be permanent on the Santa Rosa Plain. It ends up being a little tricky um, because with the lowering water table, and I don't mean to be a downer on this, but with the, lo the lowering of the water table, our vernal pools are getting more shallow. And we need to have um, that um, 12 to 24 weeks of development for these uh, salamanders to be able to walk, get up and walk out of their ponds at the end of the summer and getting to those um, sub subterranean habitats in the upland habitat. So upland habitat for California tiger salamander on the Santa Rosa Plain includes grasslands, oak savanna, and woodlands. On the central coast, like in, in Monterey and Santa, um, Monterey County, they will move into chaparral and shrubland habitats. Most 
animals will stay within 600 meters of the pond, but they can move up to 1.3 miles um, from their natal pond. And so here's an, a, a picture of an adult uh, moving around from the pond into the upland habitat. And the upland habitat, so it could be on the lower right um, into a nice oak woodland with lots of pocket gopher burrows that are hidden and uh, we've got some wonderful um, vernal pool plants in front here. But typically what happens is the uh, pocket gophers, um, as the pools dry down, the pocket gophers move in um, and the salamanders are able to move directly into those pocket gopher burrows and then the next rains come in the um, uh, uh, fall, or the first rains that come in the fall or, or uh, early winter, then the animals can get up and out and move to the next um, uh, uh, ground squirrel burrow, or pocket gopher burrow, sorry. So the animals don't move all 600 meters at one go. They will move multiple over multiple um, occasions, over multiple seasons into different uh, pocket gopher burrows um, uh, and move around the landscape. About 20% of the popul of a population of California tiger salamanders will move in between ponds. The majority of, of them are staying within 600 meters of the pond. While we often focus on the aquatic habitat, such as vernal pools for the species, it's the upland habitat that supports this terrestrial species that spends 97% of its life in underground burrows of pocket gophers. The connection between the upland habitat for the associated aquatic habitat will be the key for the survival of this species on the Santa Rosa Plain. This topic, uh, this discussion here for tiger salamanders is short and sweet. Next month in May, I will be giving a longer version of California tiger salamander um, uh, uh, presentation. So I'm going to hand this back to Allison right now, and she can continue with her vernal pool work at the Laguna. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Trish. Yes, that was a teaser for a much longer presentation all about the California tiger salamander. I will send a link to the California Native Plant Society Milo Baker chapters general meeting page where you can find the information for that if you are interested. So I'm going to finish off by talking a little bit, wait, did I? Oh, there it goes. <laughs> um, by talking a little bit about our work on vernal pools. Um, so let me just get oriented here, sorry. Let me pull this over. Let me stop my share. Sorry, everybody. I have too many screens. Here we go. Okay. So for more than 10 years, the Laguna Foundation has been monitoring select vernal pools on the Santa Rosa Plain, collecting data on rare plant annual trends, vegetation communities, and stewardship activities. Our results, combined with other vernal pool research, some of which we heard about during this presentation, clearly demonstrate that disturbance, ecological disturbance, or management plays a critical role in maintaining the native diversity of these seasonal wetlands. The Laguna Foundation's vernal pool conservation program includes research, restoration and active management of vernal pool properties, along with public education opportunities like these to increase the number of vernal pool enthusiasts in our community. We work with private landowners, public landowners, agencies like Ag and Open Space, and partner organizations to monitor and steward vernal pools across the Santa Rosa Plain. I'd like to highlight two recent projects with Ag and Open Space um, or on Ag and Open Space land that combine all of the aspects of our vernal pool conservation program. The first of which is a project on Ag and Open Space land out by the Laguna Trail. Um, and some of you have probably heard about this exciting project um, already. But in 2018, we received a special permit to collect sebastopol meadow foam seeds. If you recall, um, you saw how those, those little seeds Michelle showed you um, 
we collected those from the wild and grew them in our nursery on site. These permits from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife for collecting endangered species seeds are extremely difficult to come by, so it was a very unique opportunity. We grew sebastopol meadow foam plants to enhance and restore a diminished population of meadow foam that occurs within the Sonoma County Regional Park's Valletto Field wetlands. That's a lot of, basically it's a wetland area off of the Laguna Trail. We collected about 500 seeds in 2018 and ended up collecting 130,000 seeds in 2019 from the plants we grew in our nursery pictured here. We planted out 75% of those 130,000 seeds that we harvested from our nursery meadow foam plants out in the wetlands in fall 2019, right before the winter rains. And we got some really exciting results. The seeds we planted out in Boleto Field sprouted and bloomed into a beautiful population of thousands of Sebastopol meadow foam last year. And the work here has continued. We repeated our method of stewarding the area in fall 2020 by raking up thatch with a group of teens this past fall with support from Ag and Open Space. This is kind of mimicking that disturbance. Um, this is our form of management. We basically have folks rake and act in place of grazers. In this particular site, we also use grazing to management as to manage the site as well. We bring in um, sheep that come in the summertime to graze this wetland area, we came up and raked up the thatch after the sheep had gone. This year, we are hoping that the amazing population boom of last year is enough to reseed the site on its own without help from seeds grown in our nursery. Um, as Michelle mentioned, these are seeds that kind of stay in place. As we were raking the thatch, we could see plenty of those little seeds that were sitting in the bottom of the, that wetland area. So now the question remains, um, if these methods worked and if we got enough rain. We will be exploring this on an outing coming up this spring, a vernal pool exploration. This outing is full at this time. You're welcome to join the waitlist if you want. We will be having more of these outings in the future, um, hopefully more next spring when we can have more people out together at once. So Ag and Open Space protects and stewards other properties with vernal pools, such as this one in the Santa Rosa Plain called Harotunian South. It has a popu population of Blenosperma bakeri, the Sonoma Sunshine Flower, and I am pleased to say that these pictures are from this year. It's not all doom and gloom. Um, they looked pretty good, which is great. The Laguna Foundation has monitored this population as a part of our vernal pool monitoring program for 14 years. So Ag and Open Space and the Laguna Foundation will be hosting a vernal pool work party out at this site in June to prevent blackberry encroachment on the vernal pool area. Space is limited right now for that um, outing, but you can sign up for that on our website. The Sonoma Sunshine will not be blooming at this time, but you will be helping to promote the diversity within the vernal pool area by clipping the blackberry. And there may be some real late bloomers in the pool at this time. So both Ag and Open Space and the Laguna Foundation staff will also be undertaking other stewardship activities at this site in the coming years and continue to monitor the Sonoma Sunshine population, as well as the diversity of other vernal pool plants out at Harajunian South. So that is a lot of information about vernal pools, um, a lot of information in a short period of time. I hope that you see how much there is, how much that is special about our Sonoma County vernal pools and vernal pools in other areas as well. Um, I have some announcements and things for ways you can get involved with vernal pool conservation, vernal pool stewardship, and where to see them. And we also got some questions that came in through the chat. So I just want to say a big virtual round of applause and thank you to our presenters to start. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to our audience. 
And then I'll give some brief announcements and then we'll have some time for Q&A right at the end before we close out. So wanted to mention a few things. First of all, where do you see a vernal pool, right? That's one of the questions we got. It's a great question. Um, there are a lot of vernal pools are on private property. There are some vernal pools that are publicly accessible. Right now, a great place to see a vernal pool is at Tomodachi Park in Sebastopol. They have a beautiful population there of California buttercup and it looks great right now. So I would highly recommend going to visit that site sooner rather than later because California buttercup is an earlier bloomer. It's a great place to practice your vernal, just vernal pool ID. You'll be able to see the vernal pool kind of right in the middle of the site. Um, there's a real change in the vegetation there. Um, and the other place to see vernal pools, as I mentioned, you can see them off the Laguna Trail. It's pretty far off trail and can be hard to find. Um, but there are vernal pools in the wetlands off the Laguna Trail. I'm not sure if they're open to the public yet, um, but a great place to see vernal pools is the Earl Baum Center for the Blind in Sebastopol. They have been closed to the public during COVID. I am not sure if that has changed since we recently entered the orange tier, um, but I will include a link to these places in the follow-up email. Just check their um, regulations and their status before going, but they have a wonderful vernal pool walk on their property. And we actually manage, the Laguna Foundation helps them manage those vernal pools. They do have Sebastopol meadow foam in their pools. So those are some good public areas. Youth Community Park is another one that has some vernal pools. Um, and we will send links to those public areas where you can view vernal pools, again, in the follow-up email for your reference. If you want to get in, if you are inspired to get involved with the conservation of these special places, a great place to get involved is the California Native Plant Society Milo Baker chapter. We have a thriving conservation committee at this point. It keeps growing. I would recommend dropping in and seeing what you can learn. Um, they are always working on a variety of different conservation efforts um, and commenting on plans um, throughout the Santa Rosa Plain, throughout Sonoma County that may affect native plants. Again, I will include a link to that in the follow-up email. I would encourage you all to get involved that way as well. Um, let's see. There are, and it, you, you can join our outings. I will say we have such limited space in our outings right now because of COVID, but we are, you can go out with the Laguna Foundation to see vernal pools. Um, and I would sign up for our e-newsletter to stay up to date. You can also follow us on Eventbrite. That's where we post all of our events to get, get the first notification when we post new vernal pool outings. So that's another good way to see vernal pools. And as you're visiting vernal pools, I wanted to mention to use some etiquette around visiting these areas. I recommend brushing your boots um, and using spray to prevent the spread of Phytophthora, which is a, oh gosh, what? It, it's bad. <laughs> so, it's, it's a water mold. That it's can a water mold. The Thank plant. you. Thank you. Yes. So use that on the bottom of your boots. Brush your boots to prevent spreading seeds from invasive plants in other areas where you've likely been hiking and enjoying the beautiful wildflowers in Sonoma County. And then use your best judgment and caution around the pools. I generally stay in the upland habitat. These areas are adapted to disturbance. They can handle a little bit of walking, but I stay out of the central area of the pools, stay on the edges of the populations of wildflowers, and do my best to take my same trail in and out. And again, um, these areas are really special and we want people to see them and enjoy them. That being said, we also want to preserve these really rare populations that exist in the vernal pools. So just viewing them at a safe, well, viewing them at a safe distance for the wildflowers um, and using some of those methods to not bring in any more introduced species into the pools would be great. Um, 
Anything else to add? Any other announcements from other folks, other panelists? Yeah, Candice. I, um, I guess there's a lot of general nature lovers on this call. If you want to learn more about insects, um, I'm part of a group called the Pacific Coast Entomological Society. And we've been having a lot of meetings on Zoom lately. And we also have meetings at different places around the Bay Area. Um, and we have, I'll put the website in the chat and you're welcome to join. It's like $25 for a year and we publish a journal. You'll get journal, you know, the journal sent to you and stuff. Or you could just join the email list to find out about the meetings. So everyone's welcome. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Candice. Yes. And if you are also a just general wildflower enthusiast, Pepperwood has wildflower walks. Um, they might be close to full at this point, um, but you will include a link to that in the follow up email as well if you want to get up to Pepperwood Preserve and see some of the beautiful diverse wildflower landscapes they have up high on the eastern part of the Laguna watershed. I was going to say we don't have technically we don't have vernal pools, but we do have some vernal ponds, which this year they're going to dry down really early. So um, it's not a good year for wetlands, sadly, but gorgeous displays throughout Sonoma County right now. Yes, now is the good time to go out and see wildflowers in general. We had some questions come in in the chat. One of them was, can you see vernal pools now with flowers? None of the vernal pools on the Santa Rosa Plain that I know of actually filled all the way up with water this year. Most of them are very dry, um, meaning they are a little soggy right now, but there is not any standing water at this point in the vernal pools that I have seen. That being said, there are flowers blooming in the vernal pool area at this point. Um, so you can see the flowers, you may not see the water, but you will see the trace of it and that change in the landscape still. Um, you'll see that kind of darker green semaphore grass in some of the pools, um, and you'll see flowers in various gradients along the edges of the pools. And then we had some other questions which we can jump into now if, any, if we're finished with announcements. Any other announcements out there? Okay, well, there was one um, question out there about, I think Trish, that is for you. I think this was kind of answered, but maybe you just want to clarify real quick. How can the tiger salamander live or burrow underground? So that's a great question. A lot of people ask that. Um, tiger salamanders don't actually burrow under the ground. That's why they need the pocket gophers and the California ground, ground squirrels um, uh, to provide that upland habitat. And um, a colleague of mine, Michael Van Haddam, studied um, tiger salamanders in, Contra in Alameda County, and he actually dug false tunnels for them, and then the ground squirrels moved in, and he actually has videos of the ground squirrels just running over tiger salamanders, and the tiger salamanders, you know, slopping on top of the ground squirrels. So they um, have co-evolved uh, to inhabit the same tunnel system. Um, the Neither the pocket gophers or California ground squirrels um, are eating amphibians, they're eating seeds, and the amphibians are eating all the insects that are attracted to the seeds underground and the nice, moist uh, environment. So that's how they survive. Great, thank you for that clarification. It's a good question. And Again, just what a cool and special species that we have here on the Santa Rosa Plain. I have never seen a California tiger salamander, but I know they are out there and it is so special to visit these vernal pools and know that they aren't just supporting the amazing flowers you can see easily, but also these pollinators and these salamanders as well. Um, there was another great question early on that I can start to answer and then I'll see if anyone else wants to chime in. And it was about, let me see, should created vernal pools, like for the mitigation of construction and development, be managed? For example, there's vernal pool property that has high invasive species that might create 
fuel for fire should they be pres prescribed burned? It's a great question. Um, and as I have, I might have said this, so I don't work in our conservation science program. I go out with them on surveys occasionally and I've learned a lot to share this information with the public. And what I believe based on the research that we've done is that it depends on the vernal pool, of course, that's always the scientific answer is it depends. Um, but in general, management and disturbance is good for vernal pools. Um, and that I think is true in my, from what I would understand, it is true whether they are created or natural. Um, Candice or Michelle, do you wanna chime in? Um, I'll just say that I think a lot of the created vernal pool sites have grazing on them. Like they, they know to help keep down the invasive grasses that they'll rotate grazing on them. So um, I know at one point there's, there's concern about an invasive mint, pennyroyal mint, and there's been some, you know, looks about what's the best way to control it, pulling, herbicide, combination of both. I don't know what the status of that is right now. I don't know. That's not like a livestock plant. It's not good for livestock because <laughs> it's kind of toxic. So that is an invasive plant of concern for vernal pools. But a lot of the taller grasses can't grow in vernal pools because of the water and the soil. So. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add on to that. So um grasslands to stay grasslands absolutely require disturbance and these pools are a part of that grassland complex right so you know historically there was a lot of disturbance there were years where there might be a ton of water that were carving out potentially carving out new pools or creating new habitat um there was fire here put on the land by people who lived here um, and or natural wildfires. Um, there were ungulates that were quite plentiful in the Laguna area. So these are hooved animals that would move through, they would be grazing, browsing, causing disturbance in the soils. All of those historical impacts have pretty much been removed and a lot of the water has been channelized. So we've changed the hydrology as well as the disturbance that's occurring out there. Um, what I've noticed in a lot of natural pools is that that are untouched, you know, not managed or disturbed or stewarded, um, is that you, on dry years like this, you might get some grasses moving in because there's not the inundation period. And those grasses have a lot of silica content. And what happens is they will lay down and become what we call thatch. And these are, it's plant material essentially that sits there for a long time, slowly oxidizes, doesn't really go anywhere, but it suppresses growth. It suppresses biodiversity from all the little seeds underneath waiting to get, you know, get their way through these thicker and thicker layers that might be contributing to a degree, what we call a degraded pool system. So um, there's been some studies, especially in the Central Valley, on grazing impacts that are beneficial to vernal pool communities. I'm not so sure about fire and what's in the literature about fire, but um, from what I've observed from the fires, like the Tubbs fire and Kincaid fire, as well as prescribed fire we do at the preserve at Pepperwood, um, fire greatly enhances the diversity of grassland systems. So yeah. Yes, what? thank you, Michelle. Yeah, the I- The other thing about grazing, sorry, I just want to cut in. The other thing about grazing oh, yeah. that we are not paying, it, um, that we don't get when a fire goes through is the nutrients from the poop. Uh, and those nutrients um, uh, allow a lot of insects to start growing and to start turning over in the soil and stuff. So, uh, yeah, we prefer grazing rather than fire burning for, for vernal pools, at least for wildlife. Yes. Yes, thank you both. There's a lot. That was a lot of great information. We... Yeah, different kinds of grazers can be used differently in vernal pools too. I know we've like talked about sheep versus horses in some of our management plans for different vernal pools. Um, and in general, yes, disturbance is a good thing. We also have some hopes for potentially using prescribed burns as a tool in the Laguna watershed for managing some of our vernal pool sites, even possibly some ag and open space sites. Some of our staff work very closely with Fire Forward through Audubon Canyon Ranch and we are hoping to use it. It's a really efficient management tool um, when used correctly for management of that thatch that Michelle was talking about. Um, 
And speaking of management, uh, this came into the chat. If you have a vernal pool on your property that could use management or you would like advice about how to manage it yourself, you are welcome to contact our conservation science program manager at the Laguna Foundation. Her name is Sarah Gordon. Her email is sarah at lagunafoundation.org. I will include it in the follow-up email. She can help advise you on management of vernal pools um, on your property, and we could potentially work with you um, to manage that vernal pool um, for you. So we do work with private landowners. If you know of someone, um, please do reach out. We would love to get involved. And then, yes, we talked about um, how to prevent the spread of Phytophthora. You can use an alcohol mix. I use an alcohol mix in a spray bottle, spray the bottom of my boots. You can use about 70% alcohol. That should kill the bacteria. Um, and Michelle also says that she's heard of using diluted bleach spray working well, along with brushing off the mud and seeds. I think this is a really good press, best practice for pretty much hiking anywhere in Sonoma County at this point. So it's great to get in the habit and especially with visiting these already very impacted ecosystems as well. So that was one of the questions. Um, there was another one further up here. Let me see if I can take a look. Um, where was, oh, um, oh, maybe that was the main, I think that was the main one. We've had some questions about, again, where to see vernal pools. We'll include that in the follow-up email. Um, Am I missing anything? I can't I don't think so. What about this one from Janet? How do you defend the importance of vernal pools to those ranchers and landowners that do not hold threatened species as being important? Great, great question. Um, we work with a lot of landowners. This is probably obvious, but we work with a lot of landowners who want to manage the vernal pools, who are aware of how important this ecosystem is. Um, I think that they can coexist as we, sh as I showed in one of the photos earlier, there was a photo of a vernal pool on a dairy off of Yano Road. Um, and I think perhaps Trish or more could speak to this, but agriculture has been present on the vernal, on the Santa Rosa Plain for a long time. It is possible to have your grazers, to have your dairy, and also have vernal pools on your property and manage them together. And so I think when we are talking with folks who have agriculture going on on their land, we're working with a landowner who does ranching, we will try to come up with a management plan that includes both. Um, and if anyone else wants to chime in, Trish, if you've experienced this with your work through CTS, please feel free to chime in. Yeah, really on the, um, the uh, in the um, Contra Costa County, Alameda County, the ranchers there are really on board with coexisting um, with uh, tiger salamander habitat, um, mainly because tiger salamanders love the big cattle ponds, but they're very aware that it's not just the cattle pond itself, it's the upland habitat. And so um, oftentimes uh, the right approach for for ranchers with these sensitive habitats is um, to just point out the benefits that the ranchers can obtain um, by having this type of habitat on their, on their property. They can also set up a conservation easement on their land that helps them with taxes. Um, it helps them, um, you know, continue with their ranching capabilities, but setting aside in perpetuity um, the land for the, for the animal and the habitat. So it's really, it's a dialogue that has to, to, to get um, started and, and carried forward very sensitive, <laughs> sensitively, yeah. Yes, yes, and that, yeah, directly relates to some of the work that Ag and Open Space does too, kind of creating these longer management plans, longer plans for conserving the land with landowners. It's very much a collaborative process. Um, 
and really dependent on what the, each property looks like. Again, it depends on the vernal pools, the hydrology, um, and the land. So I think, let me just stop sharing my screen here and we are coming close to the end of the program. Thank you all for being here. I'm just gonna make sure we hit all these wonderful questions that were coming in. It's great to have such an engaged audience in this topic. Um, please feel free to reach out to me with any questions. And again, if you would like to manage vernal pools on your property, reach out to Sarah. And thank you again for being here. Thanks to all our partner organizations. Um, if anyone has any last questions, we've got just a couple minutes, feel free to drop them in the chat. And otherwise, I think we have covered just about everything that came in. Do any of our panelists have any last um, announcements or thank yous or anything they would like to say before we sign off here in just a couple minutes. I don't know how well this will work on Zoom, but I can try to show some of the bees. I have a little collection here. Cool. Oh the ring light is. So oh, that's too reflective. <laughs> I'll take off the glass. But um, I have, I just made like a small collection to show to people of like one, one of each of the different things that I found. So this is a honeybee. I have to do that backwards. That's a honeybee. And then all of these are my, on this row are mining bees. So these are, you can see they're about two thirds of a size of a honeybee. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then, yeah. And I found some different beetles, butterflies, a lot of different flies. The little flower beetles I was talking about are super tiny. They're like the size of a pin. They're, they're right here. They're on little, they're on wow. little paper triangles called points. And um, yeah, I also, um, associated more with the vegetation around the vernal pools there's a lot of flowers and stuff and so I found a lot of a lot of, in springtime so lots of things are out I ended up finding 62 different species of bees in total I don't associate those all with vernal pool plants you know I found like the oligolectic species and sweat bees um yeah carpet beetle larva will eat your cotton clothing they they also eat insect specimens so we're constantly like watching and looking to see if you can see like their little larva and if you see them then you have to um, put them in the freezer right away or put in a little fumigant but yeah um, a lot of these bees are like very tiny like they're, they're so little um so they're amazing <laughs> and what, someone is says, what is this? are you yeah. talking about this okay so yeah. this one is all beetles and this is a longhorn beetle serambicid beetle um, I happened to find that one just like running on the ground um, at Alton Lane. So um, there's a lot of oak trees. So oh, like this, for example, 